We've been doing this amazing series on Joshua, first time for everything. And it's just, it's always amazing, isn't it, to look into the Bible and to see the lives of people who we're going to meet someday. People who lived their lives the best they could following God and serving Him and trusting Him and being obedient to Him. And as Pastor Ian shared this morning, submitting to God and giving their lives away to Him. And Joshua is a great example of that. And as I was thinking that we were coming to this encounter night, I was looking back at his life to see where the sort of pivotal moments were, the landmark moments, the moments that he might have written down in his journal that he would have had seared into his memory forever. And one of them is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. It's just a quick verse. But it says so much, because in Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, it says, Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hand on him. In Joshua's life, there had been a moment. There'd been a moment as he'd walked with Moses, who was his mentor and his leader, when Moses had taken him to the side and said, you're next. It's going to be up to you to lead the Israelites into the promised land. It's going to be up to you to conquer the land that God has given to his people. And in that moment, Moses has laid his hands on Joshua and he's prayed for him. And I believe tonight we're going to do the same for people in this room. Moses has laid his hand on Joshua. He's prayed for him and it says Joshua was filled with the spirit of wisdom. And we're going to come back to what that looked like in Joshua's life a little bit later. But first, I'd love for us all to understand a little bit more about what it really means to be filled with the Spirit. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that since the beginning of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men, so that we have no excuse. What the Bible's saying to us in that passage is that God reveals himself to us in the word, but he also reveals himself to us in the world that he has made. He reveals himself to us in his creation, of which we as people are the pinnacle. We are the crown of God's creation. And all of creation testifies to who God is, to his character, to how he works, how he functions. And as I was thinking about this this week, I realized that in all of creation, there is nothing that is completely self-sufficient. In all of creation, there is no organism, no animal, no person, no plant, no tree. There is nothing that is completely self-sufficient. Everything that has any form of life in it needs some form of input to survive. Trees take in carbon dioxide and they take in water and they take in nutrients and they take in sunlight and they turn it into the energy, the glucose that they need to grow. You and I take in food, we take in water, we take in air and it keeps us alive. All animals do the same thing. Everything that has life in it needs to be fed, needs some form of external input. Even the machines that we create, with all our ingenuity, There is no machine that man has made that does not need some form of fuel. There is nothing in this world that survives completely self-sufficiently. And in fact, even our God exists in glorious interdependence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even our God does not exist in a self-sufficiency in the unique elements of the Trinity, but as the whole Trinity, they are interdependent. God the Father needs the Son, needs the Spirit. God the Son needs the Father and the Spirit. God the Spirit needs the Father and the Son. They are gloriously interdependent. Self-sufficiency is not something that our God understands. It's not something that he has designed the world for. But it is something that as fallen people we crave. Is something that we want. 
deep within us. Every one of us wants to be as self-sufficient, as autonomous as we possibly can be. When I was a little boy, I, I lived in Africa for a while and there was a, a race called the Paris Dakar Rally. And I loved, I never actually saw it in the flesh, but I loved seeing all the pictures of the, the rally cars and the motorbikes that would cross the Sahara Desert. And all those vehicles would have been specially modified to be able to handle the rigor of racing across the Sahara Desert. And in particular, one of the things that always struck me, particularly when you looked at the motorbikes, was that the fuel tank was massive. They would put the biggest fuel tank they could possibly get onto those bikes because there's no SO service station in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And they needed to be able to go as many miles as they possibly could without having to refuel. I think we're the same. We want to modify our lives to be as self-sufficient as we possibly can be. It's programmed into us. When we talk about electric cars at the moment, the one thing that everyone says is, well, it won't get you very far on one charge, will it? And then you'll be parked up by the side of the motorway waiting while your car's plugged in for it to get enough juice to go another couple of hundred miles. And it frustrates us. And we don't like the idea of being dependent of needing that external input into our lives because all of us crave self-sufficiency. But the reality and the truth for every single one of us is that we are only moments, we are only moments from death if we don't have oxygen. We need food, we need water, and we need to breathe. But you know that if you stop breathing, you literally have minutes to live. We can't survive without oxygen. We can't survive without breath in our lungs. And as it is in our physical bodies, so it is in our spiritual lives. We need breath, we need oxygen in our lives. You know, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, at the very beginning of the Bible, at the beginning of time, in time before time, these words are written. The earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That word spirit is the word ruach. It means the breath of God. The breath of God was hovering over the formless void at the very beginning of time. At the beginning of time, the Holy Spirit was present as the breath of God. The breath that you and I need today. In John chapter 20, Jesus says these words to his disciples. Chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive my Holy Spirit. The word there for spirit in the Greek is the word pneuma. Same word as we get pneumatic tools from. It means air. It means breath. Jesus says to his disciples, Go. He breathes on them. And he says, receive in you the breath of God. Receive in you the oxygen of God. Receive the life of God within you. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples as he commissions them, as he declares peace over them. He is breathing the breath of God into their lives. When I came to this church eight or nine years ago, I was under the illusion that the Holy Spirit was an optional extra. Like when you get a Mr. Whippy and they ask if you want a flake. Doesn't make much of a difference to my ice cream whether I have the flake or not. It's an add-on. It's an optional extra. You could take it or leave it. It's all right for some people. Some people like a flake. I'm not that bothered. Take it or leave it. I was so wrong. I was so wrong. The Holy Spirit isn't an optional extra. He's not an add-on to our Christian life. 
He's not something that we tack on at the end. The Holy Spirit is the oxygen of our Christian life. He is the air that we breathe. We breathe him in and we breathe out the love of God and the compassion of Christ. We breathe the Holy Spirit in and he sustains us and keeps us and changes us and molds us and shapes us. The Holy Spirit is our oxygen. When someone's drowning and the lifeguard pulls them out of the pool, the first thing they do isn't give them a sandwich. They fill their lungs with oxygen. They do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, don't they? It's the first thing of CPR, one big breath and then the chest compressions. That's how it works, because we need oxygen. And I believe tonight that there are people who are here and in your walk with Christ, it's maybe like you've been swimming underwater for too long. And you feel like pretty soon you're going to run out. You're going to take a deep gulp and all that's going to go in is water and it's not going to end well for you. And I want to tell you tonight that the Holy Spirit is your oxygen. And each one of us needs to learn how dependent we are on him that we can't go on without him, that we can't survive without him, that we can't do this walk without the Holy Spirit within us. When I watch professional swimmers, the thing that always strikes me is the, the rhythm of their stroke. Two strokes and they come up for a breath. Two strokes and up for a breath. That's what sets them apart from an average swimmer like me. They've learned the rhythm of filling their lungs with air so that they can keep going. I think I've lost that rhythm so often in my life with the Holy Spirit of having him as a daily moment by moment, breathe him in, breathe him out. Jesus says to his disciples, learn the unforced rhythms of grace in Matthew chapter 11. And tonight I think he says to us, this is a moment for you to learn those rhythms. It's maybe a moment for you just to come to the surface and take a big gulp of Holy Spirit air because actually you've been down for so long that you're not even swimming anymore. You're barely surviving, you're drowning. And as I was praying over this message, I really felt like there's people here this evening and you know you're at the point where the next breath you take, if something doesn't change, is gonna be a breath of your old life. Because as far as you're concerned, this God thing hasn't worked out for you. And I want to tell you tonight, please don't. Don't go back to what you used to know. Don't go back to what used to keep you going. But tonight, come and encounter the Holy Spirit. And let his breath fill your lungs and keep you going. See, when we fill our lungs with the Holy Spirit, he does so much for us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He prays for us with groans that words cannot express. The Holy Spirit will fill your lungs and as he comes out of your mouth, he's praying the things that you can't even articulate, that you can't even say. In Romans 8 chapter, verse 26, it says that the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Maybe you're here and you don't even know if you belong to God anymore. Can I encourage you? Take a deep breath of the Holy Spirit and let him tell you again tonight that you are precious, that you are loved, that you are chosen, that before you were born, he saw you, that he chose to go to the cross for you. Don't let me say it to you. Breathe deep of the Holy Spirit and let him say it to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit gives gifts. Gifts of wisdom, of healing, gifts of speaking in tongues, gifts of prophecy. The Holy Spirit is our air. He is our oxygen that keeps us going. Joshua had that moment in Deuteronomy where Moses laid his hand upon him and prayed and he was filled with the breath of wisdom 
And if you read through the book of Joshua, the beautiful thing that you'll notice is that chapter after chapter, Joshua comes back to God and says, God, what do I do here? And the Lord speaks to him. He'd learned the rhythm of grace, of coming back to God at every moment, at every decision, of asking God, of hearing from him, of being filled with that spirit of wisdom, of breathing God in. In fact, it was such a lifestyle for Joshua that it's noted in chapter 9 when Joshua messes up with the Gibeonites that they didn't inquire of God, that Joshua had fallen out of his rhythm of asking and receiving, of communing with the Holy Spirit, of breathing him in and hearing God's heart for the situation he was in. Wherever we are tonight, it may be that for you it's your first time to come and to breathe deep of the Holy Spirit. I'd encourage you, he's not an add-on, he's not an optional extra. He's absolutely essential to living this life, to getting through. Maybe your rhythm's all out of whack and you're splashing around desperately trying to get your breath. Then come. Come and let your rhythm be reset. Come back and say, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry that I haven't prioritized you, that I haven't made you the, the focus that you, that you are desperate to be. Come and refine that rhythm. Maybe you're here this evening and you know that you want one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit can put into you. Come and breathe deep of him because you won't get it just in a moment, just in a now and again asking. Those gifts come from learning the rhythm of walking with the Holy Spirit day to day and having him as the air in our lungs. Can we stand together? We came here tonight to encounter God. We came here tonight because we believe in a God who's alive. We believe in a God who has something for each one of us. And church, I believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe he is the oxygen in my life. I stand before you tonight and I say, I can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. And for every one of us, every single one of us here, that is true, whether you recognize it this evening or not. And so we're gonna sing, we're gonna worship, and we're gonna respond. And the only way to respond is to come to God and say, you're right, God, I do need you. I need you for this situation, I need you for my day-to-day -day life. I need you for healing. I need you for power. I need you to give me the boldness to reach out to my friends, to my family. I need you to be a witness. I need you to get through this situation, whatever it is. The Holy Spirit is the oxygen, the breath of God in your life. So we're going to make time tonight for all of us to come and breathe deeply of him. The band are going to play. We're going to worship together and come forward. Come forward so that we might pray together. Come forward so that the Holy Spirit might do what only he can do. Because every one of us desperately needs him.